Chairman. Good morning. Please sit down. Uh, we have with us today Sri Samarasimha Redigaru, one of our very senior a statesman politician who takes active interest in the affairs in and out of positions of power. It doesn't matter to him. It is a very big, a very large family in, in uh, Mahbub Nagar. All of them, the families produce several statesmen, his brother, his sister, so many of them. He is, uh, he has been uh, holding the positions of power in the state as minister, as an MLA and continues to be very active in the, in politics. He is one of those rare politicians who spends time in the libraries of the assembly and parliament whenever he, he gets time. That is the kind of erudite scholar we have with us today uh, to address us. Sir, may I request you to kindly... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my proud privilege to be present here amidst you. Particularly, I have heard a lot of appreciation for all of you while sitting from the director. As young parliamentarians, your contribution and your uh, quest for knowledge has been highly appreciated. It's happy to note that in Bhutan, the parliamentarians have playing a pivotal role in their uh, contribution towards furtherance of democracy. The subject that has been uh, posted before us today, the functioning of parliamentary standing committees, in democracy. I have prepared a note. I think it must have been circulated to all of you. Copy? Copy? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's coming. It's coming. Our Indian constitution is the basis for the entire democratic system that has been prevailing in India. The constitution of India which is the foundation of Indian democracy, emerged from the Constituent Assembly, which were charged with the task of preparing it, consisted the views and opinions of stalwarts like Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Babu Rajendra Prasad, Chakravarti Sri Rajagopala Chari, and eminent jurists like Sir Alladi Krishnaswamy Ayya, and from statesmen's category, Mr. Gopal Swami Ayyengar, as well as philosophers, politicians, and economists. A lot of contributions have been made by everybody in their own way in furtherance of democracy. The principal architect was one Mr. B. N. Rao, who structured the drafting committee. Because a reading of the Constituent Assembly debates as young parliamentarians, it would uh, be a boon for their improvement of knowledge. Similar way, the, the Constituent Assembly debates makes us know the role of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, who piloted the bill in the Constituent Assembly. As well, has played a very pivotal role. The main task was of the Indian democracy is not to allow under the constitution or any enactment to tamper in any manner with justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Once the democracy is thought over, we immediately come to the American democracy and the American federalism. Indian federalism is totally different from American federalism because Indian constitution is not based on American model, but it is a federation superior and consists of states 
comprising union and subordinates to the state center. Ultimately, Indian democracy through the constitution turned out to be a sovereign democratic republic and citizens of country achieved and secured. There are, this is the preamble of the Indian constitution. Justice, social, economic, political. Liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship. Equality of status and opportunity that has been enshrined in a vainglorious verbiage in Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. Fraternity assuring the dignity of individual and unity and integrity of the nation. Later, 42nd Amendment. So far, Indian Constitution underwent 97 amendments. The 42nd Amendment of the Constitution of India, the word socialist and secular was added next to the word sovereign. But subsequently, the 43rd Amendment repealed the 42nd Amendment and the word socialism and secularism were retained in the preamble. Here, everybody has to accept that Indian democracy and the fulcrum of the Indian Constitution clearly depicts the influence of great Western revolutions like French Revolution, German Revolution, Russian Revolution at every level. Indian Constitution ultimately can be termed to dictate and render to the people by all laws made through its three wings. Because Indian, Demo Indian Constitution is a three-wheeler, consists of legislature, executive and judiciary. These three wheels have to function with cohesion. If any one of the wheels starts wobbling, the vehicle will never reach the destination. That is the very reason why Indian Constitution always took care by the founding fathers of the Constitution, though it has undergone 97 amendments, that itself shows how the Constituent Assembly people thought about it, and later the parliamentarians thought about it in a, in a practical thinking or functioning in a society. This by itself shows that the Indian perfection of the Indian democracy and the independent judiciary, as the Supreme Court and High Courts have been very effective as custodians of the Indian Constitution accompanied by Parliament. Here, I may bring it to your kind notice. Part 3 of the Constitution, which consists of Article 12 to 35 of the Indian Constitution, deals with the fundamental rights. There were a number of uh, case law on that aspect from Apex Court. One sensational judgment was pronounced by the then Chief Justice, Justice Koka Subarao, as the Chief Justice, considered full bench. It is a very historical case called Golaknath's case. Golaknath's case. Under which it was held, Part 3 of the Constitution is unamendable. Unamendable. Because that deals with the basic structure of the Constitution. That destroys the basic structure of the Constitution. That was the thing. Later, Keshavananda Bharati's case came which annulled this Golaknath's case, said, no, 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 Parliament is supreme. Parliament has got powers to do it. But yet, yet, there was a rider kept there saying that in Chandra Kumar's case and later in S.R. Bommai's case, it was held by the Supreme Court. Here I may bring to your notice whether the action of the President of India is justiciable or not was the question posed. Whether the action of the President of India is justiciable or not. The independence of the judiciary, the perfection in which the Indian judicial system has been working, has been clearly stated in it saying that if it is hitherto the viewers, it is not justiciable. But then S.R. Bomai's case it held it is justiciable. If it is provided, it is a bona fide order, it is not. If it, there is some malafides, look into it, 
it is definitely justiciable. That's how. Though, though, though the entire judicial system is, faced, is based on a salutary principle, just disarray at not just dare. It's a, it's a Latin uh, maxim, just disarray at not just dare. Judges only declare the law. They don't make the law. Law-making body is the parliament. But even the parliament, if it tries to tinker with the fundamental rights aspect of a citizen, See, whenever the executive exercises its arbitrariness, the only organ that comes to the rescue of a common man is the judiciary. That must be safeguarded. And in safeguarding the fundamental rights, the Supreme Court and the High Courts at the state level and National Apex, Apex Court is Supreme Court, they have been very, very jealous in protecting the interests of the citizens of the country. Now, in the functioning of the assembly, that's the legislature at the state level, as well as at parliament at the central level, because, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll illustrate to you about the assembly. What happens in the assembly is, the moment assembly I, I, I think you must have gone to the state assembly. They will be going on the 17th. Ah, you, you will see. The moment they assemble in the morning at 8.30, first will be the question hour. Questions, answers. Questions will be put much, a few days before, and answers will be ready. They will be circulated with the concerned member who puts the questions, and the concerned minister gets up and answers the question. After answering the question, Member is not satisfied, he immediately puts a supplementary question for which the minister has to answer. There will be officials sitting at a corner to assist in case some information is needed. That's how they function. After question hour, then some short notice questions will come. After short notice, some call attentions will come. After call attentions, half an hour discussion, or adjournment motions, or zero hour will come. In zero hour is an hour where you can raise anything and ask anybody about the functioning of the democracy or about the problems of the people. Later, what happens is the subject for discussion on that day will take place. Suppose if it is a budget, budget is presented, discussion will go on on the budget. After budget, the demands will come. The demands of each department. Suppose a lack, of course, is the budget of a state, out of which for irrigation there is 40,000 crores. For education there is another 40,000 crores, has been earmarked. Those demands will come. What happens many a times is, these demands are not at all discussed. I don't know how, how the word of gelatin has become popular with the French Revolution. Now the gelatin has been placed here for gelatining the discussion on the subjects in the house. Because the current topics, current issues are discussed more on the floor of the assembly or parliament. And there will be no discussion at all for this. The, 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 those discussions are all gelatin. To prevent that, this parliamentary committee system has come into force. Parliamentary committees, because all the states, so far as Andhra Pradesh is concerned, there is no parliamentary committee system even today. Only 10 states have been following the parliamentary system. First to adopt was Kerala, later West Bengal, later Tripura. I have given out the list in my yes. paper, <coughs> all the paper. And in parliament, you have got 21, 21 committees. What is the job of these parliamentary committees? To examine the bills referred to it. to consider the demands of grants to the concerned departments and report to the House, the financial report of the concerned departments, to examine the policy documents in their long-term effects, to examine the annual reports of the concerned department. 
they have a right to visit to the places concerned with permission of the Honorable Speaker and also to appoint subcommittees in the process. All this facilitates the House and the members to know what is happening in each department as well as scrutinize the issues at micro level with red bare discussion amongst themselves and make a recommendation for implementation of his reports without any delay or lapse with coordination between legislature and the executive. In Kerala state, legislature has adopted first time with 14 committees, 14 subject committees. Assam and Himachal Pradesh have departmental committees functioning with its number varying every year. In Tripura, there are two committees. In Mizoram, five. Orissa, ten committees are functioning. In Goa, we have 12 standing committees, apart from eight ad hoc committees. That's how the system has been. Each state has its own style of uh, these standing committees. It has been found that the system has been departmentally related to standing committees is very, very useful fruitful, meaningful, and subject experts are giving their advice before these committees because subject advisors cannot come to the assembly and give their advice. With these committees, they can come and give their advice. And all the groups who are interested, either with the bills or on core issues with respect to the grants, this is one of the most useful things in a functioning of a democracy these committees contribute for. Generally, during the course of session, adequate time does not come, as I said it. Because uh, current issues, suppose there is some sort of disturbance at somewhere, it has become a law and order problem, and are some excesses by the executive. During the course of uh, sitting of the House, the discussion will be more concentrated about it. They don't think about the other subjects. Paucity of time makes things paucity of time. With all these things, how are we to function effectively, fruitfully, meaningfully, purposefully? These committees do a wonderful job in furtherance of democracy. See, in the parliament, as I said, there are 31 committees, out of which 21 are from Lok Sabha, 10 are from Rajya Sabha giving allocation to different parties. Every member of the parliament is accommodated in one committee or the other. And the duration of the committee is one year. And who appoints the, because there are two houses, upper house and lower house. For 10 committees, the upper house chairman of the Rajya Sabha appoints the chairman of these committees. For rest of the Lok Sabha speaker appoints. It's for one year. They'll be rotating. But members are totally in knowledge of what is happening in every department because they are being distributed from one committee to the other every year. On, on a total perusal of the entire system, it can be concluded that the parliamentary standing committees have been playing a dominant, purposeful, meaningful, fruitful contribution with checks and have a an eagle eye on the democracy in India to be a role model for the world with law and justice equally to all. Here I have to submit, as a student of jurisprudence, I am reminded of a famous uh, definition of jurisprudence because generally, who defines jurisprudence? Anybody will say in the same. Manu has defined jurisprudence. No, it's not Manu that has defined jurisprudence. It is one famous Roman jurist by the name Alpian defines jurisprudence. Alpian. The definition of jurisprudence goes like this, because my memory has not failed me. Just, I just remember it from my college days. That is, jurisprudentia est divinarum atque humanarum rerum noticia justi atque injusti scientia. 
that is jurisprudence is the science which governs and regulates the conduct of a human being in a regulated manner by drawing a line of distinction between divinity and humanity here a read a, 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 a close scrutiny of this definition of the jurisprudence which is the fulcrum for a democratic society makes the collective will and wisdom of the people to govern the society in a democratic way it's not the question of writ of an individual should run if the writ of an individual is to run contrary to the democratic structure that is the end of democracy then another famous jurist by name agustini says remota justicia quid sunt regna nisi magna latrocinia what is empire without law and justice it's a robbery on a grand scale he says how apt it is to be made applicable to some of the countries where the rule of law or democracy doesn't function properly but still but still people to get over all this the democracy is the only alternative to make a society to function in a cohesive manner keep keeping up the aspirations of the people alive and meet to the demands of the civilized society with these few words i thank all of you for giving me an opportunity to put forward my point of view on this functioning of the parliamentary committees in a democracy there will be discussion thank you gentlemen <laughs>